uh, our, uh, uh, our presentation will, uh, will have as a subject of the Dutch Trotskyist movement in the long 1960s, 1950s, extending to the 60s. Um, yeah. um, the research for our paper is based on a, on a book we wrote uh, this year. Um, it's a monography on the history of the Dutch Trotskyist movement, which is well, from the beginning to uh, 2000, 2010, and um, uh, was very well received in the in the Netherlands, and was also well not so much, but there was some debate uh, amongst the different Trotskyist movement. Not so many as in uh, as in Britain, but still there are a handful of, uh, of currents that. Uh, present themselves as Trotskyists, and uh, because of this um, this research, we uh, we found several sub subjects that we think are interesting to uh, to present. But of course, we have to uh, select, and we uh, we, um, we selected the, the issue on the, on the different generations. Um, well, as we all know, the Trotskyist ideas played an important role in the 1968 revolt. And, for example, the League Communist yeah, uh, played an important role in, uh, in, in, in France, in Paris. And at the same time, for example, in Britain, we had uh, the magazine uh, Black uh, Dwarf. It was an important new left uh, newspaper. And when it managed to link the zeitgeist in style, provocation, playfulness with consistent socialist politics. In uh, West Germany, too, we had a Trotskyist uh, uh, movement. Uh, for example, uh, Mandel uh, grew out uh, in, in Germany to become an iconic figure with close contact uh, to important students, such as uh, Rudi Dutschke. So we can, we can say that. In, uh, uh, from the obscurity of the 1960s, uh, Trotskyism re-emerged re and managed to become an influential source of ideas and activists. At the same time, however, we must acknowledge that much of its influence was indirect and that formal Trotskyist organization did not benefit greatly from this. Only in France and Italy did Trotskyism become a significant, sorry, significant presence within the youth movement. Um, but in the Netherlands, uh, it's more or less the same. Um, the movement was influential because Trotsky's ideas on organization and Marxism were adopted and because Trotsky had close, close contacts with prominent movement leaders. But even so, the Trotsky as a movement or, or as an organization did not benefit from this greatly. This is a photograph, a picture of the Trotskyist activists protesting against the intervention in Prague in 1968. It says, uh, support the Czech communists, give the Czech socialism a chance, socialist youth so, so, uh, in solidarity with Czech socialists, etc. And also, um, so if, there, there are a number of photos from this scene, and the photo that is taken from the other angle shows a banner saying, Russians go fight in Vietnam. Um, so one of our findings, uh, of our central findings in our research have been the confronting pull that Trotskyism had on its activists. People who were politicized and joined the movement often remained politically active throughout their whole adult lives. Furthermore, we can distinguish between three main generations of Trotskyists. The first was mobilized in the 1930s, the second in the 1950s, and the third one in the 1960s. So here we have some uh, photographs of a uh, central Trotskyist. Uh, the first one on the left is Saul Salton. Uh, he worked uh, for a long time with uh, Pablo. And the other one in the center is uh, Rijn van der Horst. He was uh, very active in the trade union movement. And the third one is Max Plecker. He played a role in uh, 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 supporting the armed resistance in, uh, in Algeria by working in a factory in Morocco. So the factory in Morocco uh, then made arms for the Algerian. 
it's one that uh, Ian Virtue also said, uh, said something about this uh, in, his, in his paper. So this is the second generation. Uh, uh, the, the, to the left is Ivo Cornelissen and Rijn van der Horst and Lisette Levin. Uh, uh, well, a few of them also have uh, a Jewish uh, uh, origins and uh, uh, actually the, 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 the Lisette Levin, she was not uh, a, a, a real member but was a sympathizer but uh, still we had uh, we could use her uh, memoirs, which are very telling. And this, however, brings us to an interesting paradox, which subsequently informs our research question. While the first and the, sec the third generation of Trotskyists remained active through their elder lives and often remained closely connected to the movement, <coughs> this was not the case for the members of the second generation. Those people uh, that joined the movement in the 1950s had all left by the time that the third generation became active, the third generation in the 1970s. Most of them left politics altogether. How can this strange situation be explained? This then is the question that we aim to answer in our paper. To answer this question, we uh, will not so much look in the political, into the political organizational history of the movement, which is quite impressive, and more organizations than members uh, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> we are, of course, well versed in the interest, interest piece of Trotskyist politics and organizational developments. We are far more interested in the political, in the political culture of the movement. Rather than looking at the movement from an organizational perspective, as top down, um, the experiences and emotions of the activists themselves uh, will be central, bottom up. To do so, we will focus above on, all on memoirs and ego documents of Trotskyists, of which there are quite a number. Well, these are different books. Uh, Adios Compañeros is by Saul Sutton, and it's, uh, it's of course uh, about his Dutch experiences, but also on Latin America. That's because the, the title is telling you. Ivo Cornelissen. Uh, he was. Uh, he wrote, I think, four books. Uh, uh, which, uh, deals with his uh, memoirs uh, in the Trotskyist movement. Uh, Lisette Levin. Uh, it's it's a it's a novel, but it's uh, very general about uh, the, the Trotskyist movement. And he came up in Europa. I think his book has also been published in English in Europe. And one part of it, well, a small part, uh, is uh, is about. Uh, it's written by Hein Riethoff, which is one of the figures we uh, saw earlier. Um, and these ego de documents will then tell us, will us, allow us to analyze the context between the first and the second generation and to probe what it meant for those activists to be a member of the Trotskyist movement. So now I will give the floor to Bart. Okay, so if we want to research this, so what is being sent out from this first generation towards the second generation and what then does the second generation do with it, so how do they adopt it? That would be the focus. Um, let's just have a brief look at um, first at the first generation. Um, so what is important, at least for this story here, is that uh, the first generation, so these are youths who became active in the 1930s and then straight went into resistance work during the German occupation. And that was for them a heavily traumatic experience. And it teaches them the, the, the importance of working in a clandestine way. <coughs> but those ideas and feelings are then in the 1950s reinforced by the politics of deep entryism. So becoming a member of the social democratic movement while keeping your Trotskyist affiliations a secret. So all these ideas of how to work, eh, kept stemming from the German occupation, are sort of like reinvigorated in the early 1950s. And that then brings up what we then term uh, uh, this uh, um, culture of illegalitis. Nobody can be trusted, only those with whom you have been working for more than 10, ten years. Nobody, uh, uh, or no place is safe. Um, so that also means that the youths who joined the movement in the 1950s are never truly integrated into the Trotskyist 
movement. Like they, they rarely become members of the section and they are uh, um, also promoted to organize independently like Trotskyist groups. And so these so they are very close to it but, but they never they are never fully integrated into that. Okay, so if we look at that from the perspective of the second generation, these are people who were children while the German occupation was happening. So they have no uh, um, adult life experience of that. But at the same time, um, what happens is that all kinds of images and stories and that, are, that are flowing free, uh, flowing free in, in, in post-war uh, Netherlands, um, these are all sort of like working as a background against which political experiences are uh, framed. So non-direct experiences become sort of like a background. And that of, of course also therein plays a role that many of these uh, uh, 1950s youths had a Jewish background. And um, what then happens is, and, and how we want to close off, there are three uh, um, anecdotes which we think are very telling of how that then works, how the political culture in this movement is then informed by these kind of experiences. Um, and after that, of course, we'll come to a conclusion. So uh, I will be reading this, if, if you like, but just to have a background, this is uh, in the early 1960s, it's a 1st of May celebration. And Igor Cornelissen, of whom we saw a photo, describes this in, in his memoirs that um, they rented out a place um, proclaiming that they were a travel organization, a travel association. But then while they were in that place, they held a 1st of May uh, meeting, a secret. And then it comes. So there's a comrade from Latin America and he's uh, telling about uh, the struggles in the Bolivian tin mines. And then just as this person forcefully described the heroic resistance of the workers in the Bolivian tin mines, a waiter entered, unannounced, with coffee. And everybody quickly starts to uh, look at vacation photos in, in an artificially relaxed way. Uh, and a Latin American comrade, who was obviously not informed of our disguise, continued talking in a loud voice. <laughs> obviously, he believed that we had lost interest for his report, so he stood up and raised his voice even more. And it took some time before Sal Santa had explained to him the meaning of our interview. And then comes the kicker, so this is then what Igor Cornelius adds to it himself. My impression was that the waiter took an excessive time to serve him. <coughs> and so maybe even this waiter was a secret agent. No one can be trusted. So this is comical, I know, but, but, but it also is in highly informative. So we'll take another one. Um, this is... Um, Igor Cornelis and Lisette Lewin and another uh, of other youths, they go postering. So they have these posters and they uh, start uh, uh, um, hanging them up the streets. But this is illegal in the early 1960s, so they are arrested while doing so. And then they are brought into the police office and then they are brought uh, before uh, the head of uh, police, or the chief of police, and to explain where they started, because you know, then the police will take off all these posters. And when the police officer asked where the wind had started, she answered on the Waterloo uh, climb. And while she was walking back to the other arrestees, she walked past Leon, uh, and that's, that's actually Igor Cornelissen. They looked at each other, and then Emma whispered, started on the Waterloo climb. And the thing is, so if you would have where they started, and here you would have uh, Waterloo climb, and uh, that, that they posted a bit more. So, you know, this whole street is then out of you know, the police doesn't know about it. And then it comes, uh, thus, Emma saved the Kalverstraat and the Rembrandt, these two streets which were not mentioned by her. And this was a moment of intense satisfaction and fellowship. She was, and this is, she was part of the resistance. And the resistance that refers, that word alone refers directly back to the German occupation. But this idea of saving is even more uh, indicative, saving that, that refers back to saving Jewish uh, citizens by hiding them in your house. And she was herself Jewish. So Santa here, and we see also Pablo, they are arrested in 1960 uh, because they had been forging papers and they had a plan of forging uh, French bank banknotes. I can 
I will not go into it. But when they are arrested, uh, this whole idea of we are actually in, a, in an area of war, we are being occupied, we must act clandestine, is only reinforced ever more. And I take this, so there's, there's a lot of uh, examples, but I'm taking this one, again from the memoirs of Igor Cornelius, I'll just read it out loud. He says that, I remember a nightmare, not long after the conviction, uh, conviction of Saul and Michel, that shows that I too had been affected by slight paranoia. In my dream, I was visited by two men in white coats, one with an injection needle pointed at my direction who tried to friendly persuade me to accept their treatment. I resisted forcefully and woke up with a bleeding hand. Yeah, I'm almost done. In my dream, I had stepped out of bed, uh, I'm sorry for all the uh, uh, typos, uh, I had stepped out of bed and hit the door of the balcony right at the spot where there was a nail pointing out. And then, it, then, then comes the moment of reflection. What had I all mixed up? The Moscow show trials, the conspiracy of the murders in white coats as Stalin's last anti-Semitic campaign, or simply the medical tests in German camps. I had not been there, but large parts of my family had. So this becomes this whole mirror funhouse, wherein all sorts of ideas of we are being under siege come together in an era where actually there's, there's, there's no uh, situation of the sort. But, but, but these people are, and in some times, you know, that takes a comical sense, but sometimes it becomes very tragic. <laughs> so, um, just to sort of like round this up, um, we wait. Ah, thank you very much. So, what what is our assessment? This first generation of the Trotskyist movement was very much paranoid, very much traumatized, not only by the German occupation, but also by this politics of deep entryism, and could not truly integrate the second generation. Okay, fine. What then happens with this second generation? They are somehow excited by this idea of working in a clandestine way, even though that also reinforces all sorts of traumas of things that they have consciously or unconsciously uh, 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 experienced. So, for example, he said Levin had indeed been hidden uh, uh, on the countryside because she was Jewish. Um, but images of the German occupation and even of the Holocaust fused with experience of paranoia, of being arrested, of political activism. And that made the mov movement both exciting and also traumatizing. When then the geo sit geopolitical situation and the political culture changed again at the end of the 1960s and with the 68 revolt and then the rise of new social movements, um, these people from the second generation could not really connect to that. That was really not part of their experience. And because these people in the second generation had never truly been integrated in the movement, because they had been looking for something and experiencing something very different, when these new movements came up, they could not connect and then step up. Thank you very much.